most people know that the type of oil they're buying, are they buying olive or canola or avocado or vegetable oil? But they typically don't know the brand that they're buying. And when there's not a lot of brand loyalty in a premium market, it's just inviting adulteration and fraud. Well, hello everyone, Dr. David Perlmutter, and here we are again with the Empowering Neurologist Program. Today we're going to be talking to my friend Jeff Nobbs, and Jeff Nobbs has really dedicated himself to exploring and making evident to, to everyone that the types of oils we are consuming may be good for us or may be threatening our health. Uh, specifically, he focuses a lot of his efforts on getting the word out uh, that seed oils and many plant-based oils in general might be threatening uh, to our health because of their high content of omega-6 and thus their pro-inflammatory nature. He has created a new oil and we're going to explore what that's all about. But first, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Jeff. Jeff Nobbs is the co-founder and CEO of Zero Acre Farms. He's a, This is a food company that's replacing the destructive vegetable oils with healthier and more sustainable oils and fats made by a process of fermentation. We're going to explore that. Prior to Zero Acre Farms, Jeff also co-founded a restaurant a chain called Katava, a food security nonprofit called Health Kitchen, and a rewards a shopping platform called Extra Bucks. He's also served as COO for Perfect Keto and general manager of Rakuten uh, after it acquired Extra Bucks. Jeff blogs about health, nutrition, and sustainability at jeffnobs.com. That's J-E-F-F-N-O-B-B-S.com. Uh, Jeff uh, is a very, very interesting young man who is pursuing his passion. I've had many conversations with him and look forward to our time together today. Let's get started. Well, Jeff Nobs, welcome to the program. Great to see you. Great to see you. Thanks for having me on. In the uh, intro, the setup, I was talking about you know the dangers of these high omega-6 oils that seem to be so ubiquitous and so highly consumed uh, really around the world now, let's call it like it is. And uh, I think, you know, obviously you became aware of that. Take us through the process of your recognition of the need and then how you decided to to make, make changes, to make things happen in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, the world of nutrition was opened up to me pretty early on. For whatever reason, I became uh, very passionate about food and health. And something like middle school started flipping over packages and looking at how much sugar there was and brought weird things like chicken breasts and radishes to school as my lunch while my friends were eating pizza and burritos. I don't know why exactly, um, but you know that was kind of the path that I was on. And fast forward about 10 years in my early 20s, and uh, I had some deaths in my family and went down a rabbit hole on why that happened. Uh, They're from various chronic diseases. And what I kept coming back to was food and health and diet and lifestyle. And one of the foods that uh, seemed to be the lead domino was high omega-6 seed oils or vegetable oils. And so then I went, also went down that rabbit hole and the evidence became abundantly clear to me, both from the randomized controlled trials we have in, in humans and in other mammals, rodents, as well as uh, the correlations and associations between these uh, seed oil consumption and, and uh, poor health outcomes. And so I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, researching this, looking at alternatives and concluded that there's no good alternative out there that at scale can replace oils like soybean oil and canola oil and safflower oil and corn oil. And you know, there, there's a dozen or so others. Uh, so set out to figure out how to solve that problem, which ultimately led to starting Zero Acre. So when you're walking down or anybody's walking down the aisle of a grocery store, there are just shelves and shelves of clear bottles of oil that may have been there six months. We don't know that are, you know, advertised in cooking magazines. You see them advertised on television being heart healthy because they're derived from sunflowers. And that looks really great. The sunflowers growing in the fields and corn, for example. Uh, but what's wrong with that picture? What is that doing to us? The primary thing that's wrong with that picture is the fatty acids that these oils contain. Fatty acids are primarily what make up fats and oils. Um, are fine when eaten in small amounts and evolutionarily consistent amounts, 
but seem to cause a lot of health problems when consumed in excess. And the primary fatty acid that has been linked to a number of health issues is called linoleic acid. It's uh, the most abundant omega-6 fat in our diet. And most real whole foods, you know, most of which you, you advocate for, are one, two, three, you know, maybe four percent linoleic acid. And these seed oils are upwards of 70, 75% linoleic acid in the case of something like sunflower oil. And, you know, soybean oil isn't far behind. Uh, and, and then the rest from canola oil to corn oil, cottonseed oil, peanut oil, et cetera, are, are sort of between like 20, 25 and uh, 50 or 60% linoleic acid. So needless to say, orders of magnitude more than the amount found in real whole foods. And that particular fatty acid oxidizes quite easily. So it's very unstable. Uh, when we consume it, it's like a grenade exploding into shrapnel in our bodies. And you know, part of the reason it's so hard to pin down the detrimental effects of this particular fatty acid when it oxidizes is all of those molecules that it oxidizes into uh, go down their own paths metabolically and in our bodies. And uh, you know, there are several that, that have been shown to be outright toxic, you know, defined as toxic by toxicologists, um, such as HNE, which is a molecule we can get into. Um, but even on its own, linoleic acid stays in our cells for years. It has a half-life um, of, you know, that's measured in years, a couple years. And that linoleic acid then makes up the fatty acid bilayers in, in all of our cells. Uh, anytime our, you know, we literally are what we eat. So anytime our body needs fats, it's from our diet or from stored body fat, which also comes from our diet. And when those fats are made up of uh, unstable molecules such as linoleic acid, it, uh, it, it leads to this, this step of oxidation, free radical formation, and ultimately inflammation and chronic disease. What's it going to take for people to understand that these oils that they are buying and using uh, are, are actually threatening their health? Because this is the type of oil that, let's say, Americans are using. People are using the various types of seed oil that are on the shelf. They're using it for cooking. They're using it for recipes. Uh, and, and frankly, uh, there, there's certainly a lot of these oils in packaged goods as well. I mean, read a label, right? That's made with corn oil, made with uh, you know, any other type of seed oil. You see it very commonly. Yeah, what, what makes it very difficult is, like you said, these oils are in nearly everything. You, know, you, you can make the smart decision for the oil that you buy for home cooking, but most people still like to go eat out at restaurants, either to treat themselves or, you know, out of convenience or accessibility or affordability. Um, and and when going to the grocery store, you know, it'd be great if we all bought fresh whole foods as every ingredient. But often people, you know, stop by the chips aisle or buy something when they're when they're waiting to check out. And nearly everything has one of these seed oils in it, um, primarily because they're they don't really taste like anything. Um, so, you know, you don't have a competing, say, coconut or olive flavor in the food. Um, they're liquid, which makes them easily easy to work with. They have relatively high smoke points. Um, so you can, you know, burn the heck out of them uh, and, and it won't smoke up your kitchen too much compared to something like, a, you know, fresh butter. Uh, and, and they're cheap. And so as a result, they end up with everything. And hey, you know, a, a little fat or even a lot of fat in most foods makes those foods taste better. Uh, even, even if they're coming from oils. And it doesn't help that, you know, the, the American Heart Association recommendations for, for what a heart healthy oil is um, are, are still based on the idea that omega-6 fats are essential, which they are, um, but that there's, you know, there's no real upper limit. Or if there is, it's, it's something much, much higher than what we've historically consumed. And so as a result, like you said earlier, these big, clear plastic jugs with fluorescent lights shining on them for hours, days, weeks, months on end, you know, further oxidizing that oil before it even gets to your body, those get a heart healthy label. Um, because interestingly, um, or maybe obviously for you know, nutrition researchers, seed oils do lower LDL cholesterol. They, they effectively lower LDL. However, that lowering of LDL in randomized controlled trials isn't, is, is not only not correlated to lower rates of death, but is actually correlated to higher rates of death in, in studies that have come out just in the last several years. Um, and, and, and so that lowering of LDL, you know, I like to say, would you rather have low LDL and, and be in a grave or high LDL and, and be, you know, be alive and, and living a healthy life? 
Um, it's just a biomarker. It's, you know, it's not an end outcome like uh, death or mortality, but that's what most of those heart healthy labels are, uh, are based on is that biomarker. You know, I, I'm thinking that um, the exposure that we might get from having seed oils in manufactured products that we would eat, I shouldn't say we, but I guess that, that yeah, whatever people eat. Um, <clears throat> might be more threatening if a person's on a low fat diet, because as you said, we need dietary fat and we're going to make our cell membranes out of whatever's around. And if you've deprived yourself of good fats by being on a low fat diet, and yet you're getting these vegetable, uh, rather seed oils, uh, based upon, you know, eating the snacks, then your body's going to construct cell membranes out of, and, and that includes neurons, uh, membranes. Uh, out of whatever's around. In this case, it's going to be a very unstable type of fat that's high in linoleic acid and therefore at risk for oxidation. That's right. Um, many fatty acids compete with each other. Uh, and the, the two fatty acids that compete with each other sort of most in the spotlight is omega-6, of which linoleic acid is a type like we've talked about, and omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, alpha-linolenic acid, which is the form commonly found in plant foods, as well as EPA and DHA, which a lot of folks, especially those with babies, have heard of uh, for, for brain health and for a number of other functions in our body, um, which, which are primarily from animal foods, specifically cold water fish. And omega-6 and omega-3, they compete enzymatically in, in our bodies and in various pathways. So one of the best ways to uh, increase the amount of omega-3 that your body is able to use and metabolize and work with is to actually decrease the amount of omega-6 that you consume. And to be in a good balance based on today's levels of, of I'll also say our, you know, the, the broader, the royal we uh, of America, um, to, to, bring, to bring our omega-6 to omega-3 in balance based on how much we're currently consuming in omega-6, we'd have to eat sardines and salmon at nearly every meal to be anywhere close. Uh, you know, the, the far better strategy would be to reduce omega-6 so that the omega-3s we're consuming, whether they're from beef or fish or flax seeds, uh, can, can actually be utilized by our bodies. Now, you mentioned that the, the concern is that they're so, these oils are so high in linoleic acid and that uh, there are breakdown products of linoleic acid that are really, really threatening. You mentioned HNE. Maybe we could double click on that for just a moment and talk about what that is and its association with things like cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's risk, and things like that. HNE is a molecule. Uh, HNE is an acronym that stands for 4 hydroxy nonanol. I'll just say that once. But uh, it's typically referred to in papers as HNE or 4-HNE. HNE um, HN -E is an aldehyde. So your listeners may have heard of aldehydes from things like cigarettes and formaldehyde and um, you know, usually not something we want to be consuming a lot of. HNE is generally recognized as the most toxic aldehyde. It's able to cause damage not just locally, but travel far distances in our bodies and cause damage elsewhere. Um, so toxicologists consider it one of the, the most problematic aldehydes. And HNE is derived from one source and one source only, and that's omega-6 fats. And omega-6 omega fats are overwhelmingly uh, from seed oils in our diets. Like we talked about earlier, there's a little bit of omega-6 you get in real whole foods, but orders of magnitude, uh, lower amounts than you would receive from seed oils. And H&E seems to be linked to a number of diseases and pathologies, as you mentioned. Um, obesity and weight gain is one of them. And this research has been building over the course of the last several decades, actually, it first started in a research experiment in single cell yeast, where uh, these individual yeast cells uh, were treated with HNE. And after two hours, the yeast cells had either, uh, that they were treated with HNE had either gained a significant lipid accumulation or you know, got fat uh, or had died. And the yeast cells that were not treated with HNE had not seen nearly the same levels of, of fat accumulation. So the experiment was then scaled to uh, C. elegans, uh, or, or a roundworm, which is a multi-cell organism. And uh, th the same thing happened. The roundworms that were treated with HNE, you know, you can see this under the microscope, um, they start to balloon, they gain weight. And then the experiment was scaled to uh, rodents. And it was found that rodents that had a, uh, an intentional gene mutation that didn't allow them to detoxify HNE, thereby um, resulting in higher HNE levels, they gained weight. And what's really interesting 
is um, they gained weight, but were given the same amount of food. So, you know, you may be thinking, how the heck can you gain more weight if you're given the same amount of food as your, you know, your friends um, who, who are eating the, you know, the same amount? Um, and it seems to be that their metabolic rate significantly slowed. So the more HNE that they had circulating around their blood, um, it, it seemed to break something. And uh, that, that breakage caused their metabolic rate to slow. So, you know, if you kind of look at calories in, calories out, they're eating the same amount of calories, burning far less, uh, not because they, you know, weren't motivated to exercise, uh, their metabolic rate had just slowed. And then in humans, you know, which all these animal experiments are great, uh, but what does it mean for humans? We don't have a randomized controlled trial in humans, but there's good associative data where uh, an experiment took um, uh, lean, athletic uh, individuals, obese individuals, and average individuals. Uh, and the obese individuals had the highest levels of HNE. The lean, athletic individuals had the lowest levels of HNE. And the average individuals had something in between. So it's just association, but it at least aligns with what we've seen from you know, experiments in single cell yeast up to uh, rodents, other mammals. And uh, HNE has also been linked to a number of other pathologies from dementia, Alzheimer's, um, you know, breaking cells in the case of potentially insulin resistance. It's still early cancer. Um, so th this is a really interesting in a negative way molecule uh, th that only comes from seed oils and could have implications in a whole host of health issues. You mentioned earlier the uh, discussion and awareness of the omega-6 uh, to omega-3 ratio and how uh, you, know, you could uh, take more omega-3, you'd have to eat an awful lot of omega-3 rich foods if you want to improve that ratio or lower the ratio, or you reduce the omega-6 intake. But I think the context of that discussion, omega-6 to 3 ratio, has really focused on inflammation. So how does the consumption of these oils and a linoleic acid, how does that relate to actually increasing inflammation in the body and why is that important? When we consume seed oils, which are high in linoleic acid, this omega-6 fat, like we talked about earlier, um, it becomes incorporated in every cell in our body. And um, when, when those fatty acids go through their normal process of breaking down, um, it, it happens for polyunsaturated fats like omega-6 fats <clears throat> much quicker. And the result of that breakdown is um, free radical formation. So when, when, a, when a fatty acid oxidizes, it means it loses an electron. And that electron floating around, um, you know, when you, people have heard of antioxidants, for example, um, or, or free radicals. These are words we throw around a lot, but most folks couldn't tell you what they actually mean. Uh, antioxidants combat oxidation. And so they, they lend an electron, um, thereby reducing oxidation. But if there aren't enough antioxidants to combat all of the oxidation, uh, then we're left with free radicals. And free radicals, uh, in that imbalance, more free radicals, you know, oxidation leading to more and more free radicals, not enough antioxidants to combat them, that's defined as a level of oxidative stress. And that oxidative stress is what leads to inflammation. Um, you know, our, our body, it's like a bunch of bullets flying around our body or a bunch of fireworks going off, um, you know, all these free radicals flying around. And our body has to go try to deal with that. It's, it's acute, but becomes chronic if we're consuming these oils on a regular basis. And, you know, I, I, I can't say uh, with 100% certainty that that level of inflammation, you know, is causing XYZ disease, but a number of researchers conclude and, and you know, agree that that chronic inflammation is the foundation of a number of diseases uh, and, and pathologies that we face today. You know, the less of that you have, the better. Um, th there's no question about that. Numerous papers in, in Nature and other journals showing that 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 those high levels of oxidative stress, which are linked to inflammation, um, are, are sort of the starting point for uh, new, numerous health issues, both uh, in, in the brain and elsewhere in the body. I think that um, you know we over years traditionally looked at oxidative stress, the action of of free radicals on the one hand and inflammation on another hand is two perhaps somewhat distinct mechanisms that are involved uh, in degenerative conditions uh, and in terms of their uh, manifestation. But I think we now have an understanding mechanistically as to what may be going on. We know that in, a con in the condition of uh, increased oxidative stress in the body, it actually changes 
the the morphology the and functionality of certain of our immune systems uh, immune cells uh, changing them from uh, being supportive to being more pro-inflammatory as it relates to macrophages, changing them from being what are called M2 to M1 macrophages, becoming much more infl inflammatory, increasing the output of various inflammatory mediators like tumor necrosis factor alpha. So uh, it's great that we're starting to understand how these are related. And therefore, uh, you know, this is a cascade that begins with the consumption of a, a type of oil uh, that is at risk for increasing oxidative stress and therefore secondarily, because it is high in linoleic acid, uh, can therefore increase inflammation. Let's shift for a moment and um, just talk about the huge environmental impact that the, the incredible uh, footprint that these seed oils have uh, in terms of agriculture on the planet. Vegetable oils, which are sort of the broader category of seed oils, um, uh, you know, m most of our consumption of vegetable oils in, in the U.S. is um, overwhelmingly from seed oils, like the examples we've given, uh, oils from seeds and grains and legumes classified as seed oils. Um, globally, vegetable oils are actually the most consumed food in the world after rice and wheat. Uh, they're, they're also the fastest growing subsector of global agriculture. So they take up about a third of global croplands, just around 30 percent. Um, and when you look at when you look at other foods, you know that that we also eat a lot of other crops. We also eat a lot of. It, it pales in comparison to how much land we're dedicating to oil crops. It's more than fruits, vegetables, uh, root vegetables, you know, roots and tubers, legumes, uh, all all combined. And we're dedicating more crops to cereals. But when you look at how that's changed in the last sixty years, um, our consumption of or our land use for cereals and um, and and. Uh, carbohydrate crops, wheat, et cetera, has actually gone down, but skyrocketed for, for oil crops. So um, yeah, something's got to change. You know, it, it's, those crops are actually two of the top three causes of global deforestation. Um, and, you know, that has, that has real implications for biodiversity loss, for climate change. You know, when we're cutting down rainforest to make room for foods that harm us, uh, that's just not a system that makes any sense. You know, if, if we, if we cut down some rainforest to grow foods that um, tripled our IQ and made us live for to be a thousand years old. You know, I think that's a they would be more smart enough not to do it anymore. To be, we'd be a bit more conflicted, maybe. Um, but to cause all this damage for food that clearly is not good for us, you know, that that's what doesn't make any sense. Um, so, so that's what that's what sort of you know we, we've talked about the health angle. There's also this huge environmental angle, and palm oil is a is a vegetable oil that gets a lot of the spotlight. Um, Interestingly, palm oil is the single most productive oil crop. It requires the least amount of land to produce, you know, one kilogram or one ton of oil. The issue with palm is it only grows in a very narrow band near the equator. That happens to be where our most biodiverse, carbon-rich rainforests, um, you know, also thrive. So land that goes to producing palm oil was previously, you know, peatlands or a rainforest, um, which is why they have such a big greenhouse gas emission, you know, carbon footprint and are, and are so impactful in a negative way in biodiversity. Um, but the, you know, there's a big push to replace palm oil with other oils. The issue is if you replace palm with something like a hydrogenated canola oil or soybean oil, we're just taking up way more land in a different part of the world. And, you know, the woodlands in the UK or grasslands in Canada, um, you know, those are valuable too, maybe not as valuable as the rainforest, but the ideal scenario would be minimal footprint, and not in a very uh, highly biodiverse carbon rich region of the world. It would seem that uh, m most people, or perhaps some people, uh, would really, their tipping point on whether an oil is good or bad wouldn't be its omega 6 uh, content or linoleic acid content for that matter, uh, or, but rather focusing on saturated. Is it a saturated fat or is it not? And I, I think you've uh, described the notion that. You know, our fear of saturated fat should really pale to our concern uh, over omega sixes. Well, one way to look at it is a lot has changed in the last, you know, 50, 60, 70 years um, <clears throat> since saturated fats began to be demonized. And our consumption of saturated fats, it hasn't increased. If anything, it's gone down a little bit. Um, at the very least, it's flat. And during that same time, rates of obesity and chronic disease, you know, went from 
uh, rare to commonplace. I mean, you know the stats, six in 10 Americans now have a chronic disease, 40 plus percent are obese, about that same rate, 40% uh, have multiple chronic diseases. And w- when we look you know, to the early 20th century, um, certainly the levels of chronic disease and obesity weren't that high. You know, they, they were closer to the single digit percentage, but the data is not very good. Um, so if saturated fats were truly so bad for us, it doesn't really make sense that if we haven't consumed more of them, that our rates of obesity and chronic disease continue to increase year after year after year. And our healthy life expectancies uh, over the last 11 years have actually decreased uh, each measurement period. We're like one of three countries in the world where that's happened. The other two or three are war-torn countries like uh, Yemen and Syria. So, we're, you know, not great company there. Um, so that's one way to look at it. You know, another way to look at it is Saturated fats are actually quite stable. We, we talked about polyunsaturated fats, omega-6 fats, how they're quite unstable. The reason for that being they have multiple double bonds that easily oxidize. In the case of saturated fat, they have no double bonds. So they're, they're very stable. Um, lipid researchers assign a score to each type of fat for how stable or unstable it is. And uh, saturated fats get a zero because they're so, you know, they're so stable. They're, they're basically not even showing up on the instability chart or uh, inherent uh, uh, instability. And then monounsaturated fats, uh, which are high in things like macadamia nuts and olives, um, they have a score of one. Omega-6 fats have a score of, depending on the research you're looking at, between 13 and 15. So again, orders of magnitude higher than monounsaturated fat. And monounsaturated and saturated are you know, pretty close. You're, you're splitting hairs at that point. Um, so they don't, these saturated fats don't appear to lead to oxidation the same way that polyunsaturated fats do, um, where it gets potentially confusing is that saturated fats do raise LDL levels, um, in randomized controlled trials that doesn't seem to lead to poor health outcomes. Now there is a question of a diet that's high in saturated fat that increases LDL levels and is very high in polyunsaturated fats from seed oils that are prone to oxidizing LDL, you know, could that actually be a poor combination? Um, Either way, you know, minimizing omega-6 and seed oil consumption solves the problem. Um, But it it could be, it it could be a not great combination. Um, You know, all this stuff's related. We we were talking about HNE earlier. Interestingly, uh, ketogenic diets uh, allow for a pathway to also detoxify HNE could be one of the ways and one of the reasons that ketogenic diets have been you know, very effective for weight loss for some. Um, and exercise is sort of the third, the third thing that can reduce H&E levels. So eat less, eat fewer seed oils, eat less omega-6, that'll reduce your H&E levels. Um, ketogenic diets can help if you, know, you, you want to boost. And then, I mean, exercising seems to help everything, including uh, H&E detoxification. So we have this this uh, concept of you know, the the vast fields of corn, for example, for uh, to make corn oil ultimately, and the environmental impact that that has. But um, there is another way. There's another way to produce oils for human consumption. And what's that all about? You've had some experience. You mentioned corn to corn oil. Plants are really good at making carbohydrates and sugar. You know, corn makes a whole lot of corn starch, corn flour, um, fibers in its, in its stalks and its leaves uh, as sugars as well. And then it has a tiny percentage of oil. You know, the same could be said for, for other crops as well. And the current system, just, you know, like we said, doesn't make sense to tear down an ecosystem, grow crops, uh, every year, tear down those crops to, uh, chemically extract a little bit of oil from their tiny seeds. You know, it's no wonder that those have huge environmental footprints. Um, and humans couldn't have eaten them in the first place without a lot of modern industrial processing. So, you know, certainly not, they haven't been a part of our diet for, for much time. Um, so what, yeah, what, what we're doing at Zero Acre is leveraging the power of plants to produce carbohydrates and sugar and actually fermenting that sugar into fat. Uh, it sounds like a novel concept, but it's actually the way that, you know, a cow's stomach works. Uh, they just eat a bunch of grass and microbes in their stomach convert that to fatty acids and a number of other nutrients. Um, So at at Zero Acre, we're fermenting sugarcane, non-GMO perennial sugarcane. And that sugarcane is completely transformed into oil. 
And that oil is extremely pure. It's over 90% monounsaturated fat, about as much omega-6 fat as um, like butter or beef tallow, you know, two, 3%. Uh, low amounts of saturated fat as well to keep it liquid. So it's liquid for, you know, salad dressings and, and other applications. Um, and be- because of the way it's grown, you know, sugar cane is so abundant. It, it's a grass. Uh, it's just a very tall grass that turns the sunlight's energy into sugar. Uh, we have about a 10x smaller environmental footprint than vegetable oil. Um, so it's called cultured oil. And uh, you know, an- another way to think about it is sugar is just carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. And oil is just ki- carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, just in very different formations. And through the process of fermentation, uh, all, that, all those atoms are, are moved around and, um, from sugar to the hydrocarbon chains that make a very healthy, pure oil. And the cultured oil, uh, what's the smoke point of that? It's the highest of any oil that we've seen or measured. Um, comes in at 485 degrees wow. Fahrenheit from a third party. We've had customers put it on a, a cast iron pan that's at 500 uh, as they started to heat it up, they said it didn't get, it didn't start to smoke until it got over 500. So it, you know, it could be higher in certain applications, but yeah, it's quite high. Why is that important? Uh, it's because of its purity. So, um, lower smoke points are often because for lack of a better word, there's just a lot of other schmutz in, in the oil. Um, you know, it's, it's not as, as pure. Um, and the oxidative stability helps a little bit, you know, smoke point is, I like to look at smoke point and oxidative stability as sort of the two measures when you're choosing a high heat cooking oil. The smoke point's important because you don't, you know, first and foremost, you don't want like your fire alarm to go off in your kitchen and you have to do the whole thing where you're blowing in with the towel because you cook something, you know, with, with too low of a smoke point. Um, and, and when an oil starts smoking, it, it can start to form some carcinogens. So you want to avoid that. And then oxidative stability is, is the other thing to optimize for. And that's based purely on the fatty acid composition. You know, we, we were talking about those scores a few minutes ago. Um, basically, you want as low a score as possible, as much monounsaturated and saturated as possible to minimize oxidative stability. So uh, is vitamin E playing a role here as well in terms of keeping it from oxidizing? Yeah, we, we had talked about, um, you know, oxidative stress as a result of your body being overwhelmed by oxidation um, and not enough antioxidant warriors to fight off. Um, all those pro oxidants or all, all that oxidation from happening. Uh, it, it's actually why most seed oils uh, naturally have tocopherols or vitamin E natural tocopherols in them is because uh, they, they need to protect themselves when they're, you know, growing as a crop and are exposed to heat and light, you know, UV light. Um, they don't want to immediately oxidize at the wrong time. So they're full of, of antioxidants, vitamin E. Um, and, Interestingly, you know, I, I think that vitamin E recommendations are very high and, and dietary guidelines say we're not getting nearly enough um, because they are, they, it, it is potentially important on a, on a diet rich in seed oils. Um, that said, so in, in, with cultured oil, we added some natural mixed tocopherols in there just to be safe, to have a little bit of extra antioxidant defense. Um, frankly, I don't think we need them. And we're considering just removing them from future products because they don't, the oil is so stable on its own. They may not do much, um, but they're, you know, they don't seem to hurt. And uh, most people could probably use a little bit more antioxidant support. So over the years, I've uh, written quite a bit about the health benefits of of olive oil uh, that may relate to some of the health benefits of Mediterranean diet. But I I really think olive oil is a, is a, uh, has, offers up some real good benefits um, and that said, though, uh, you know, I find that the the call to action uh, generally is uh, for people to be a little bit when they're feeling that they want to buy their olive oil, they may be buying things that have been adulterated. I mean, there was a big 60 Minutes program on the fact that, you know, when you buy olive oil, it's it's the Wild West that you it may be highly adulterated. That there may be all there may be canola oil in it uh, that. You know, I was asked, uh, talking to a restaurateur recently, and he was telling me that uh, they offer up olive oil if you want some for your salad. But when you look at the tin, he said, uh, we're able to call it olive oil, even if it's just 51% olive oil. The rest can be really any of a number of different types of oil. So um, talk to us about the practice in general of adulteration, and then how does that relate to cultured oil? 
Yeah, it's sad. Um, you know, if you, if you ask a restaurant what oil they use, and if, if you're lucky enough to hear olive oil, you know, and ask, is it actually olive oil or is it a blend of olive oil and canola oil? Uh, more times than not, you'll hear it's a blend of olive oil and canola oil. And often it's it's 80% even yeah. canola oil. Um, and they'll just say olive oil because that's what customers want to hear. And the issue with adulteration is real. Um, yeah, that 60 Minutes um, piece came from an investigative journalist. I believe his name is Tom Mueller, um, who did a deep dive on this. And he found that up to 75% of extra virgin olive oils in the US were um, outright fraudulent, adulterated, mixed with something else. And um, Dr. Selena Wong at UC Davis, she did a similar study on avocado oils. She bought avocado oils off the store shelf and, and online and found that 82% were oh adulterated gosh. or rancid. It's, so uh, it, it's sad because yeah. these, these fruit oils are clearly so much better than something like uh, you know, a canola oil or a, or a soybean oil. Um, and, th- you know, that said, there are some producers out there that, you know, surely are doing things right. It's just, it's just hard to know. Um, in the case of cultured oil, you know, this was very top of mind for us. And I, I think part of the reason it can happen with these more premium oils is most people know that the type of oil they're buying, are they buying olive or canola or avocado or vegetable oil, but they typically don't know the brand that they're buying. And when there's not a lot of brand loyalty in a premium market, it's just inviting adulteration and fraud. You know, um, why wouldn't the Italian mafia start to put some some rapeseed oil into the Italian olive oil and sell it for the same price? Um, you know, there's no real brand that has something big to lose. The consumer will just go to the next olive oil brand that's on sale at Whole Foods or whatever. Um, so, so anyways, this was all very top of mind as we were developing um, this company. And so with cultured oil, we actually put a QR code on every bottle so consumers can scan that QR code and uh, it's linked to a specific production batch where they can see the detailed fatty acid composition, as well as a number of other measures that the huge majority of people could probably care less about, but they're there like free fatty acids and peroxide value and moisture levels. Um, If you really want to nerd out on what's in your bottle of oil, that's, that's one way to do it. Um, Yeah. So adulteration is, is, the big issue with a lot of those fruit oils. Um, Unfortunately, they have one of the larger environmental footprints as well. Um, Olive in particular, it's sort of like the, the almond of the oil world uses a lot of water. Um, And that said, like I still use olive oil, you know, I, and and what I do is actually I'll do an olive oil cultured oil blend um, and use that for salad dressings. The cultured oil helps keep the olive oil liquid in the fridge since olive oil tends to congeal and solidify in the refrigerator. You put about half, cultured oil in there and it'll stay liquid in the fridge, but then you get those beautiful olive oil, you know, extra virgin olive oil flavors. Um, And then I'll use the cultured oil for high heat cooking. We actually had a a third party study um, look at olive, avocado, cultured oil, as well as sunflower, corn, soybean, and rapeseed oil. And uh, in in a frying pan measure after five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, I think up to 90 minutes. Uh, the, the production of HNE, that toxic molecule, that toxic aldehyde we were talking about. And um, there is no measurable HNE production after a few minutes with cultured oil, and there was with all other oils. And after about a half an hour, uh, you know, the seed oils were like off the charts. And yeah. uh, olive and avocado were somewhere in the middle, and cultured oil was just starting to register. It had about 10 times less than, um, than avocado or, or olive oil. So that's why I cook with cultured oil, but still love a good extra virgin olive oil if I'm, you know, Every once in a while, I'm dipping a little bit of crusty sourdough in it, or uh, or having a salad dressing, and the <laughs> polyphenols in it would be great too. Well, listen, good job. Uh, it you know it, it's a great story to tell um, that you know you recognize this issue. Here's a problem, and provide a solution that is not only good for us, but has a you know a really good uh, environmental uh, portfolio along with it. So that's beautiful. Well, thanks for joining us today. It's great information. Thanks for having me on. I always love talking about this and thanks for asking good questions. Sure. And, and uh, finally, where can people go to learn about what you're doing? We write extensively on this topic at zeroacre.com slash blog and cultured oil is available to purchase at zeroacre.com. I uh, would love everyone's feedback, whoever tries the oil. And I'm on Twitter at Jeff Knobs talking about all things oil all the time. You bet. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. We'll talk soon. All right. Sounds great. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Right. Well, what an interesting individual. Uh, here's his dream. His dream is to create a, a healthier oil, and he's doing it in a way that 
makes so much sense from a health perspective, that's for sure, but also uh, from an environmental impact perspective as well. And that's very interesting, isn't the whole notion of creating oils uh, via fermentation. So Zero Acre Farms uh, is the uh, name of the company. Very interesting. Uh, as mentioned, I serve as a scientific advisor to that company. And I do that with uh, good reason. I, I think they're really on to something that's very exciting. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, and we will be back soon. Bye for now. Thank you.